Well, it is a great thing to have each one of you here this morning, and uh, we do want to um, especially thank uh, Dave and Sharon again for your ministry amongst us, and uh, we'll be praying for you as you go. The Lord will give you journey mercies and blessings. And uh, I'd like to say a thank you for to also, since it wasn't put on the bulletin uh, today, but uh, a special thank you to all the people that had a part in the home school conference yesterday. That was a very uh, challenging, uh, interesting time, very helpful. And uh, uh, that's uh, a ministry. Please turn with me in your Bibles this morning to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, the first chapter. <laughs> I hope you can tell what those two things are. Right. I like to doodle, and so uh, you might as well enjoy it and serve the Lord at the same time. And uh, I have a question for you from the diagram on the board. I hope. On the, that looks like that on the board, all right? This is supposed to be a native from uh, the South Sea Islands, you know, those people that put things through their noses, you know, those big bones, right? Um, and this, I hope you know what that is. Anybody know what that is? I had ice cream cone. Thank you, Mike, for helping me out. For those of you who are just coming in uh, this morning to uh, uh, to fellowship with us and uh, you haven't picked up on the, our preceding lessons, what we're doing is going through the Gospels in the, in the first part of the New Testament to find out what they teach us about knowing God or specifically knowing Jesus Christ. Let's face it, if God put four, the first four books of the New Testament in there, to, all with the same message, to tell us about Jesus Christ. It was obviously important, right? He wants us to know who Jesus Christ is. And in fact, the entire Old Testament is there in the Bible, from, at least from one perspective, to show us, to prepare the way, that, uh, to show us that Jesus was coming. So really, even the Old Testament is about Christ. The Gospels are the four records that tell us about his life when he came 2,000 years ago. And then the rest of the New Testament, Acts of Revelation, is there to explain the significance of Christ's coming. To tell us why he came and to tell us why he's coming back and what he's doing in the present. So really the whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. And we've been looking at the Gospels, as I said, to learn more about him and to get to know him because... If we don't know who Jesus Christ is, that's the worst thing that you could be ignorant of. To know Jesus Christ ought to be our number one goal in life. It's not enough just to know about Him. That's the first step, as we're going to see today. But it's also supremely important that we get to know Him personally in our lives, that he, we have a relationship with Him. Now, the reason I put this on the board is because it illustrates two kinds of knowledge. If I was to ask you in this room, how many of you know what an ice cream cone is like? How many of you could put your hand up and say that? I know what an ice cream cone is like. Come on, tell me. I know what is I. Some of you don't, never had an ice cream cone? Some of you didn't put your hands up. Come on. How many of you know what an ice cream cone is like? Very good. I got a full response. I know some of you really know what ice cream is like. 
right? Now, that's one kind of knowledge, isn't it? I know when you say you know what ice cream cone is like is that you've experienced it, right? And it's a personal experience, right? And it's also knowledge that um, you have developed. It, you weren't born with the knowledge of what ice cream is like, were you? How old were you, Mike, when you had your first ice cream cone? <laughs> okay. yeah. And then, if you're like my wife, she's not here so I can pick on her, um, she really knows what ice cream cones are like because she's developed a taste for this stuff and she, you know, constantly is rejuvenating her taste buds and, and, and maturing her experience and, and her knowledge and she's got a very broad range of knowledge on ice cream. <laughs> right. No, there's, I didn't say anything bad. <laughs> I'm just telling you that she likes ice cream, and uh, and you know we can hardly pass one of these places uh, without stopping. Now, that's one kind of knowledge, isn't it? Uh, that's knowledge uh, that we experience. It's uh, firsthand. It's very real to us. It, it it's something that we develop uh, from point A to point B. And there's lots of things in life that we could talk about that uh, we have this kind of knowledge about. Let's talk about the other kind of knowledge. Let's think of Carlos, Carlos here, all right? We'll call him Carlos. I don't know if it fits, but... Now, poor Carlos, he lives in uh, Papua New Guinea, all right? And uh, down there, it never gets below 95 degrees, all right? There's no such thing as ice cream cone, ice cream because there's no such thing as ice, right? Now, if I was to ask you, do you think that Carlos knows what ice cream is like, how many of you are willing to say, yes, he knows what ice cream is like? Let's see your hands. Come on. Well, you could be wrong. I'm, I'm quite sure that there are quite a few people, uh, even natives in Papua New Guinea, that know what ice cream is like. They've, they've had it described to them by the missionaries. Um, in the cities, you know, there are probably lots of places where they sell ice cream, so there are Papua New Guineans that, uh, that know by experience what ice cream is like, right? They've experienced it. But there are a great number of people like Carlos here that, um, you know, maybe they've never even heard of ice cream, right? Or if they have, the only thing they know about ice cream is, uh, you know, the artists put it this way, you know, they put a little thing around it, you know, and then these little little circles, what, which represents what? Uh, the only thing he knows is a mental image, right? The theory, it's theoretical to him, it's not experienced. He doesn't, he's never tasted ice cream in his life. He maybe have heard, he might have heard some missionary explain it to him, all right? Uh, it's not personal because he's never tasted it, and he certainly never developed a taste. He's never even come in contact with it, right? It's just something that he knows about. One-time information, you know, transmitted the message. Somebody told him about it. Okay, now, those two types of knowledge are basically the two kinds of knowledge that the Bible talks about. And you can know Jesus Christ one of these two ways. Every one of us in this room this morning has one of these two types of knowledge about God and about Jesus Christ. We either have the kind of knowledge that we've experienced. We know what God is like. We've seen Him at work in our lives. He is personal to us. We have a personal, ongoing relationship, and it's developing. None of us has gone all the way, right? We haven't actually seen God with our eyes. We have not gone into the presence of heaven. We don't know fully what God is like. That's impossible for a human being to look upon God and live, the Bible says. Right? But we know a great deal, and those of us who are believers are developing and, and growing in this day-by-day -day, uh, process of getting to know the Lord better. Right? But then there are people like poor Carlos here that um, they might know everything about an ice cream cone. It's made out of ice crystals, and it's made out of vanilla wafers, and it's got cream and vanilla and uh, I don't know what else goes into it, right? 
a little bit of salt and sugar, right? He might know all about the ice cream cone. So a lot of people know a lot about God, but it's all right here. And it's never gone past there. It's all theoretical. Right? And the real danger that we face is that even Christians can have this kind of knowledge about God. Even Christians can, yes, they can have a, a certain amount of relationship with God. We can start at this point, let's say 1981. And if that was the year you trusted in Christ, then you've known Him for seven years in 1988. But it's very possible for Christians to stop learning to stop developing, to stop carrying on uh, the personal intimacy part of the relationship, uh, to stop getting to know the Lord. They can have this kind of knowledge, essentially. Right? Now, to prove that, I, I'm, I'm going to go to the Scriptures with you this morning to illustrate this, but I, to prove it, just look at marriages. Right Now, many marriages start, many marriages stop, Many marriages continue, but they might as well have stopped. Right? They have stopped developing the relationship. The, the intimacy and the, and the personal relationship has stopped. It's, it's stagnated. It hasn't, it hasn't matured. It hasn't continued. Right? That's this kind of knowledge of the person. Right? I know uh, what, um, what it what it means to be married. I know that because I've experienced that I'm in the process of experiencing marriage. Right? Some of you haven't got that kind of knowledge. You've got the other kind of knowledge, right? You know about marriage, that everybody thinks it's the greatest thing in the world, right? That sometimes it takes a lot of work and there's dangers involved and uh, you know, it's a serious subject. So there's two kinds of knowledge, those that haven't experienced it and those that are. I also know about raising children. I don't know everything. I'm in the process of learning. See? But I am doing it and I'm personally involved. But I don't, I, I don't know how a motor works. I can't really say that. See? Now I could, I've got a little bit of theory in my head, you know. You, there's a song about the, about, you know, the little old Ford that had four wheels on the ground. Right? That's about the extent of my knowledge about how motors work, right? I know that the, there's a drivetrain that's connected to the wheels and that the motor is connected, is the essential part of the drivetrain, right? But exactly the, how a motor works, I really don't know. I know it's got valves and pistons and a um, crankshaft and a timing chain and all that kind of stuff, but I can't explain to you. I've never taken one apart. I've never done it. I don't know. I couldn't fix one. In fact, I got one right now that's not fixed because I don't know. I don't have that kind of a knowledge. See? You see what we're talking about? We're talking about theory and experience. We're talking about somebody that might know all about it in theory. They might have a good idea, general perception, but it's not personal. As opposed to somebody that doesn't know it all, but they're in the process of learning. Personal involvement. Um... I don't know how many of you have been on a Caribbean cruise. I know what Caribbean cruises are like. I've seen pictures of them on television, but I've never experienced one, so that's this kind of knowledge, right? It's not that kind. Right? Um, do you know who uh, Mikhail Gorbachev is? Do you know him? Many of us know about him, but I doubt if anybody in this room has actually met Mikhail and on a, is on a first-name basis with that man and knows him as a person. You see, we're talking about the two kinds of knowledge again. Now this is crucial because knowing Jesus Christ automatically confronts us with the issue of where we are in relationship to Him in this respect. And the fourth gospel is in the Bible, I believe, to show us the difference. To, it's kind of like a diagnostic test. Right? At the education at the seminar yesterday they were talking about being able to discern where your children are in certain things and uh, spiritually as well. And you can give children tests to, to diagnose where they are at reading or comprehension or whatever. All right? Well the Bible is, is like our diagnostic test. We can read the Gospel of John and it, it will pop up the answer in front of us and I hope you'll go out of here today knowing where you are because we're going to look at it. It's going to tell you which kind of a relationship you have with God. 
Is it theoretical or is it ongoing and personal? You might know a great deal, but if it's static, and if it's not ongoing, if it's not affecting your life, then it's here. You're as bad off as Carlos, or worse. Right? I'll say one more thing before we actually get into it. I, I'm famous for my great introductions and running out of time. But uh, I, wanted to, I want you to see how practical this is. I, this is not just some strange theological screwball idea that I dreamed up last night between 11.30 and 1.30. Right? Uh, I didn't dream this up. This is part and parcel of life. You have friends, don't you? But we all have different kinds of friends, right? There are different levels of friendship. Right? We know our friends, we know the people around us at different levels. Right? Some people are purely acquaintances. Then we have um, people that, uh, where's the word, what's the word I'm looking for? We associate with regularly. We would call them our associates. And then we have people that we know even better than those people. We have friends. But then there are probably one or two people in our lives that we would call intimate friends. Right? Now even in when you talk about friendships, you're talking about knowledge on different levels. And the very same thing is possible in our relationship with God. The very same thing. Education, the same thing. When you talk about a freshman, you know where, where the person is in their education. You know they're just starting, right? If, you, if they say they're a sophomore, you know that they've advanced. If they're a senior, you know they're almost out. And if they're a graduate, you know they finished. And if they're a postgraduate, that means they're, uh, they're past one level and probably starting another one. You see? So the same thing, that has to do with knowledge. All right, let's get into it. I asked you to turn to John chapter 1. And I want to start by my first point this morning is to assume that God is knowable. Right? Now that's an important starting place because there are religions in the world that don't assume that. They assume the exact opposite. There are, there are religions that believe that God is what is known as transcendent. That is, He's so big and so infinite and so whatever that He has absolutely nothing to do with us. We're in this little cosmos and He's out there and the only way you'll ever get to know God is by getting basically out of this cosmos. So you have to... You know, you have to go through the eight steps of Buddhism to remove yourself totally from this world so that you can get to know Him. Right? That's what Buddhism teaches. Or Hinduism, you know, that you have to uh, essentially get into the state of nirvana through uh, removing yourself from the evil of matter in this world. So you, uh, you know, cop out. Transcendental meditation. You pop out of this world. Right? And you fly away. And then you'll get to know God. That's how they get to know God. But Christianity is different. God to the Christians is an imminent God, not a transcendent God. Our God is here and now. He, uh, he has made contact with us. He came and He's just as real as Vince is. Because He came into this world 2,000 years ago. And He walked around with people like you and me. And that's what the Gospel of John is basically to show us, that Jesus Christ actually was God on earth. John chapter 1 begins with the famous verse, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That's where the movie camera starts out. It's a picture of Jesus with God in heaven. The Word was with God in the beginning. Verse 14, another picture. Second picture in the movie. Now it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, John says. He's one of twelve men that lived and walked and listened to Jesus for three and a half years. He saw Him. We beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. And verse 18 in this first chapter says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has exegeted Him. He has illuminated, He has revealed, He has declared to us what God is. Jesus is the crucial link between God and man. That's why Paul comes along later and he says, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way. All right? We all accept this. This is our starting place. We have to assume this morning that God is knowable 
I don't, want, I don't really have to prove that to most of you because I think most of us believe that. Right? But I'll just remind you of some things so that you have ammunition to talk with people that don't believe he's knowable. Because there's a lot of people growing, there's a growing movement today of people that don't believe that you can really know God. Christians should demonstrate in our lives that we do know God and that it is possible to know Him. Psalm 19 talks about the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no language nor voice where, or sound, nation or something where their voice is not heard. In other words, God's creation is His megaphone that's saying He's here, He's here, He's here. He's here. The whole universe says He's here. It's a cause and He's the effect. He started it. Right? That's basically what Romans chapter 1 is talking about. That's why God is angry with people today because they reject the evidence. That which may be known of God, Paul says, is manifest among them. We can know God by looking around us. Right? That is, the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You can see it. And that's why Paul says, man is without excuse. All right? So God is knowable. Now, let's get back to what we were talking about at the beginning. All right? This is our starting place. God is knowable, and yet there are two ways to know Him. And most of us are in, every one of us is in one of these two situations. Please turn with me to John chapter 7. In the language of the New Testament, there are two Greek words. And I didn't use these words on purpose to start with because I didn't want to turn anybody off. And you don't have to know these words, but I'll tell you what they are anyway, just so, so that you know what I'm talking about. Okay? This kind of knowledge, theoretical knowledge, impersonal, general knowledge, is called oida. This is the, the Greek word oida. In English, it would look like this, oida. And, in the, and the other kind of knowledge is called ginosko. All right. Now, anytime you read through the book of John and you see these two words in the Greek, or a person like me who knows it, I can read through, every time I see one of these words, automatically, it's a dead giveaway of what kind of knowledge is being referred to. If it says in verse 17, I'll, I'll read verse 15. Jesus was talking to the Jews on this occasion, and it says, The Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never learned? How does Jesus know these things? You know what the word is? It's this one here. How does Jesus have all this vast knowledge? How does he have the big picture? How does he know all of this stuff? And, and in their minds, it didn't make sense because they knew that he was just a country bumpkin and he'd never gone to a rabbinical school and he hadn't the benefit of all the education of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. How does he have all this vast knowledge? Right? However, a different word is used in verse 17. Jesus answered them and he said, If any man will do his, that's God's will, that man shall know, over here, different word, he shall know by experience. He'll be on the process of getting to know, development, personal experience. He will know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether, it be of, whether I speak of myself. Right? Now, there's a little key there. That is, um, this isn't the best place to illustrate the difference, but it's there, all right? The Jews recognized that Jesus had vast amount of knowledge. And Jesus was saying, you people aren't even on the path. There's only the people that are willing to obey me are the people that are going to have this kind of knowledge. Right? He says, if any man will do his will. Are you willing to do God's will this morning? If you knew what God said to you, would you do it? Now, it's easy to say yes to something like that. Are you willing to give up your money to the poor? <laughs> All right. Um, are you willing to uh, witness to your neighbor? Those are things that God has said. Are you willing to do it? If a person's willing to do God's will, then you will have this kind of knowledge. Otherwise, you don't. Because basically, if you put your post in and say, I'm going to go no further. And you've cut God out. Look down in verse 26 and following in the same chapter. Um, there was quite a controversy here. Jesus had healed a man a few weeks earlier, prior to this chapter. Uh, he had been in Jerusalem, um, and uh, he had healed a man on, the, on Saturday, which was the holy day of the Jews, on the Sabbath. 
That was contrary to their laws. They weren't supposed to do any kind of work. Jesus broke their laws and he made enemies from the leaders. And they had it in for him. And so the next time Jesus is in Jerusalem, this is, this is what's taking place in chapter 7 here, uh, they're, they're going about seeking to kill Jesus, verse 25. And the, and the people are commenting on this. And they say, but lo, verse 26, he speaks boldly. And they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? The, the word that they use there is gnosko. Um, the people were asking the question, do our, have our leaders gotten this information? Are, are they growing in their perceptions? Have they developed the, the understanding that this really is the Christ? In the Jews' minds, they, were, they realized that, you, that knowing Christ, knowing the Messiah, would be a step-by-step -step process, just like it is in our lives. It's one thing to know that Jesus is our Savior and that He died for our sins. It's quite another thing to know by experience that He is our Lord. That means Master. Right? Do you know that? You might, have the, you, you might have heard the concept before. Everybody's heard Jesus is Lord, right? But is, do you know for a fact that Jesus is Lord? Have you experienced? Are you in the process of experiencing in your own life and allowing Him to be the Lord of your life? If, if you haven't experienced it, if you haven't submitted to Him, then you don't know it. That's like saying you know what ice cream is like when you haven't tasted it. See? And these people were asking the question. We'll keep going. The, the Jews said in verse 27, Nevertheless, we know this man, and they were pointed to Jesus from where he is, but when Christ, or the Messiah, comes, no man knows from where he is. Then Jesus cried in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, and you know from where I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him. Now Jesus keeps using this word over and over. It's, it's kind of like a buzzword. <laughs> I've just learned that this year. That you read through the book of John and you, you come across the word know, and right away it's giving you an indication of, uh, of personal relationship here. And it's telling us where these people were. And most of the way through this, these people were saying, oh yeah, we know all about Jesus. We, I mean, the Messiah, when He comes, we know He'll be this way and this way and this way. This was theology. This was knowledge that their rabbis had taught them. They, they, we know, we know, we know. But when Jesus came, <laughs> when they were talking to Him, and they weren't sure. They were asking, Do, has anybody accepted Him? Do they really know that this is the Christ? And Jesus was saying, you don't know me. Let's go to another passage that uh, makes it even clearer. Um, chapter 14. Uh, I'm sorry. I, please back up to chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 14. Jesus is talking to the same people on another occasion. These people didn't believe in Him. And verse 14, Jesus is talking and he, said, and he answers and says to them, Though I bear witness of Myself, yet My witness is true. For I know from where I came and where I go, but you cannot tell from where I come and where I go. These people said, We know who you are. We know where you came from. And Jesus uses this word here, and He says, you people don't even know that. You haven't even got the right facts. Right? They thought He was from Nazareth. He wasn't from Nazareth, He was from heaven. Yes, He was from Nazareth. They knew He was from Nazareth. They had the knowledge, superficial knowledge, but they, they didn't have the full knowledge. See? That's what this is talking about. They didn't, have the even get, they didn't have the, even have the big picture. They didn't realize who Jesus really was. That's what He's saying here. You cannot tell where I come and where I go. You don't have this kind of knowledge. You don't even have the facts straight. Verse 19, They said unto him, Where is your father? They, they figured they were going to settle this once and for all. Jesus answered, You neither know me. You don't have the facts straight about me. You don't know about me, really. If you had known me, if you really knew all about me, you would have known my father also. You see what Jesus does? He connects knowing Him to knowing His Father. 
And that's why, as we go through this rigmarole and preaching on knowing Christ and knowing God, that acceptance of Jesus Christ is is the starting place. It's the crucial element. There are lots of people today that know lots about God here, but it, they reject Jesus Christ. He's unimportant to them. He's something less than a God. He's a created being to some people. Some, some people don't even believe he even historically lived. right? And a lot of that's going on today. Some people think that the person Jesus Christ isn't really all that important. What's important is his recent reincarnation and the person of Sun Myung Moon or some other modern day person. They got the wrong idea about Jesus Christ. The Bible says he that does, has not the Son has not the Father. They go together. Jesus said, you believe in God? Believe in me too. Because you can't really believe in God without believing in me. That's the point. Well, Jesus said, you neither know me, you, don't, you haven't known me, if you had known me, you would have known my Father. You would have had your facts straight. And he was accusing the Jews of not even having their facts straight. Right? In other words, a lot of people, I guess the point that I'm trying to make here, and I'll stop and make it, okay, because we're in the time. The first point in, in this uh, progression or the stages of knowing God is the, there are a lot of people in category A. They profess to know God. They might know facts about God. They might be absolutely certain that they know facts about God, but they got it wrong. They know about him, but they really don't even have it. Because why? They haven't come to the scriptures for their knowledge. Right? Um, verse 27. Verse 26 and 27. We're in chapter 8. Just keep reading with me. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. John says, They understood not what he spoke to them of the Father. They understood not. Verse 28, Then said Jesus to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of Myself. But as My Father has taught Me, I speak these things. The word for understanding in verse 27, and the word know in verse 28, are both this one here. And this shows us the second category. Right? Actually, these two, first two categories go together. The people that have their facts they, they profess to have facts, proper facts about God, but they got it all mixed up anyway because they don't go to the Scriptures. They're in category one. These very same people, in relationship to this type of knowledge, this experiential knowledge, are, is illustrated here. They don't understand. They don't. They don't have an experiential knowledge. They don't have a personal relationship. They don't have... It's, it, it, there's, nothing has developed because they started from the wrong spot. Right? That's not to say they aren't wise and intellectual. I, you know who Isaac Asimov is? Have you ever, anybody heard of Isaac Asimov today? Famous science fiction writer, right? That guy's an intelligent man. I don't know how many PhDs he's got. right? But he's incredibly educated. He's wise. He has advanced as, about as far as you can go in human education and knowledge, right? He has developed but not, he doesn't have the relationship with God. Why? Because he started off with the wrong basis. He assumes that God doesn't exist. He assumes the Bible is not true. And he's written books on the Bible. I read one. Fantastic knowledge. But he doesn't have an ongoing personal relationship with God. So he's in the same category that the old Pharisees and the Sadducees were 2,000 years ago. They had a great deal of knowledge. They were leaders of the people. The spiritual leaders, they had incredible amounts of knowledge of the Old Testament. They could tell you the number of letters in some of the books. And they knew the center word and which books. And they just had it all down pat. All right? But they didn't recognize Christ when they came. They didn't know Him by experience. That's the word. They understood not what Jesus was saying. They didn't know from their own personal experience. Jesus went on to say, however, that these very people someday would know, right here. They would experience. They would know by experience, but it would be too late. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, he said, then you will know. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, if the princes of the world had really known, if, the, if they had this kind of knowledge, if they had personally experienced who Jesus Christ was, they would never have crucified him. Right? 
And that just proves that they didn't know him by experience. Well, it's possible for Christians to have, uh, as I said, it's possible for Christians to have the same kind of problems. Look at verse, um, we're in chapter 8, and I'll read verse 30 to 32. As he spoke these words, many of the people that were listening to him believed on him. So we're talking about believers now. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now we're not talking about the Sadducees and the Pharisees here. We're talking about people that profess knowledge in Jesus Christ, like most of us in this room this morning. And when Jesus said in verse 32, you shall know the truth, which of the two you think he was talking about? He's talking about this one here. You will be advancing in the knowledge of the truth of the Word of God. You'll be growing in your own personal, experiential understanding of God's Word. You will know it this way. You'll be ongoing. You'll be licking the ice cream cone and smiling and enjoying it. And you'll be experiencing all the benefits of, of experience. Experiential knowledge. Right? But there's a condition for that. And that's why I know that not all Christians have this kind of knowledge. Because not all Christians fulfill the condition. The condition is stated in the preceding verse. If you continue in my word. If you continue in my word. If you're developing. If you're passing the grade. In, in schools... You don't advance your children on to the next level if they haven't passed the one they're in, right? And a kid that refuses to learn has, uh, will stop advancing, right? The progress is dependent upon the continuous growing and acceptance of the knowledge, right? Participating in it. They've got to do the work. And Jesus said the same thing is true. Automatically, a, a Christian falls into having theoretical head knowledge. And there's lots of examples of this that I just don't have time to share with you this morning uh, of, of places where Christians know things. But uh, like Martha, for instance, that's one example I can think of. In chapter 11, Jesus came and, and she, he was on the way to raise up her brother Lazarus who had just died. And Martha meets Jesus on the road outside of Bethany as he's coming into the town and and she starts to plead with him and, and cry and carry on. And, and Jesus said, do you believe that your brother will live again? And she says, I know that whatever you ask God, that he'll give it to you. I know that there's a resurrection. In the last day, my theology tells me, she said, that in the last day there's a general resurrection. The Jews believed in resurrection. I know. You know what words are found in both of those verses? She says, I know. Twice, in chapter 11, right here. She had the theory. She knew about it, but she, she was pretty weak. She really didn't have a great deal of confidence that, uh, you know, that Christ would actually do it because she really wasn't a growing Christian. She wasn't like her sister Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and gave up other things to learn and to progress in the knowledge. See what this confronts us with? It confronts us with the issue of where we are today. You know in your life whether or not you put your post in and put television and books and fun in front of growing in the knowledge, grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, those are the things basically that stop us today. Right? I know because they stop me lots. Right? And it's only as we're willing to continue in his word that we really become learners disciples that's what a disciple is it's a learner and then a person knows you'll know the truth and there's freedom there's all kinds of deliverance from things that that uh, are hangers on for Christians that don't grow spiritually where are you I hope you've got freedom in your life I hope you've got increasing knowledge um, I hope you can say this morning that Jesus is more than just an acquaintance. I hope you can say that he's more than just somebody that you, you hear about on a regular basis. I hope that he's even more than a friend. I hope he's an intimate friend. Of course, if a person wants to have a friend, you have to show yourself friendly, right? right? Jesus 
won't actually become our friend, like he won't give us the benefits of the friendship unless we participate, unless we cooperate, unless we show that we want to get to know him. Right? Any more than your boyfriend or your girlfriend will want to get you to know you better if you constantly hang up when they call or say something ignorant to them when you do see them on the street. You know, how far is the relationship going to go? And unfortunately, I think a lot of Christians are in the position where they've got the theory. They might have the big picture, but as far as experiencing God in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis, on an ongoing developing Gnosko-type relationship, knowing Him personally at work, you have to answer that. You, you know, I know where I am. Let's pray. We come to You, Lord, and we confess that we don't know You as we should. None of us in this room. We praise you for the hope that we have that someday uh, when the scales are lifted from our eyes at the return of Christ that we shall be made like him and then we shall know him as he really is. And our Father, you've given us the opportunity. You've given us your word. And our Father, while we have all the advantages of freedom and education and encouragement from other Christians, we live in a society that 